Hello, welcome to part four, the final part of this introduction to forces. And we're going to take a look at tension and compression. We'll start with tension, explain what it means, then look at some examples. Once you understand tension, it's very easy to understand compression. We'll go over it very briefly and look at an example of compression. And finally, we'll look at some terminology that you will meet when you deal with questions about tension and compression. Terminology includes inextensible, incompressible, rigid and light, what those words mean. Let's talk about tension first. There's a purple string. Now imagine grabbing hold of the ends of the string and stretching it. I'm sure you know from your experience that it's quite difficult to stretch a piece of string. And the force inside the string, which resists stretching, is tension. So if you want a definition of tension, we could say it's something like the force in an object, doesn't have to be string, it can be anything, the force in an object which opposes the object being stretched. Let's look at that in a bit more detail. There's a ceiling, the white line. Let's hang a string from the ceiling. That's a green string now. And put a weight on the end of the string. So we've got 100 newtons weight hanging on the string. Let's assume the string itself has negligible weight to keep it nice and simple. Now the string will be taut and there'll be tension in it, stopping it stretching. First question for you. If you were asked to mark the direction of the tension, where would you draw the arrow or arrows to show the direction of tension? Pause the video and see if you can work that out for yourself. And the answer is this. The direction of tension is inwards. So I'd draw an arrow at the bottom pointing up, an arrow at the top pointing down, so the two arrows are pointing towards one another. That's what the direction of tension is. It might sound a bit peculiar, but if you think about it, it makes sense. The bottom is pulling upwards, and the top of the string is pulling on the ceiling downwards. The direction of tension is inwards. It's opposing the stretching. And the other question we can ask is, in this situation, how big is the tension? If you want to think about that, you can pause the video. And the answer is very simple. It's 100 newtons. It's the same as the weight hanging on the end of the string. And that 100 newtons will be the force of the string on the object. It will support the object in equilibrium, so it's balancing the weight. It will pull with 100 newtons upwards. And at the top will be a force of 100 newtons downwards on the ceiling. Let's ask you a couple more, two or three more questions. There's our setup ceiling, string in tension with an object hanging at the bottom. Here are some true or false statements. I'll read through them quickly, then you can think about them for yourself. Number one, if we use a longest string, the tension decreases. Number two, if the weight is 20 newtons, that's the weight at the bottom, the force pulling on the ceiling will be 20 newtons, so the tension is 20 plus 20, 40 newtons. And number three, if a section of the string is frayed and thinner than the rest, maybe the middle of the string is thinner than the rest, the tension will be highest at the thinnest part. So, are those statements true or false? Pause, think about them for yourself, and then I'll give you the answer in a moment. Let's go through them. Number one is false. The length of the string does not affect the tension. It certainly doesn't make the tension decrease. If you use very long string, maybe the weight of the string itself would become important, but that would tend to increase tension. Talk about that later. Using a longer string, if the string is light, has no effect on tension. What about the second one? Well, that's false. If you hang a weight of 20 newtons on the top, there will be a 20 newton downward force on the ceiling, and the tension is 20 newtons, as we explained a moment ago. And the last one, supposing part of the string is frayed and thinner, is the tension there higher? The answer is, it's false. 
the tension is the same all the way along the string even if part of it is thin. And later on you may learn about something called stress and stress would be higher if the string was thin but the tension doesn't change along the string. Okay, let's look at some examples of tension. A very common problem is an object suspended by a couple of ropes and each rope has a tension and you may have to work out the tension in each rope. So an object with a known weight, in this case 100 newtons, and two tensions holding it. All you've got to do is realize that situation is equivalent to this. The object with 100 newtons weight being pulled upwards with tension T1 and tension T2 in those directions to balance out the weight. If you deal with problems like this, of course you can get the direction of the forces from the direction of the strings. So the strings direction here is the direction of the forces T1 and T2. But don't be fooled into thinking that the length of the string has anything to do with the length of the vector. The length of this vector is the magnitude of it in newtons and it is nothing to do with the length of the string at all. You can only get the direction of the force. You can't get the magnitude of the force by looking at the top diagram. You have to do some calculations to get T1 and T2. Another common problem you'll encounter is two objects connected by string and the string goes over a nice smooth round surface and as the heavier object falls down it drags the other object along with it and you may have to work out the acceleration or the tension. In simple versions of the problem the tension is the same everywhere in the string. So whatever the tension in the top part of the string is, it's the same as the tension in the bottom part. So if the top box is, move, is pulled with 10 newtons to the right, there's an upward force of 10 newtons on the box on the right hand side as well as its weight downwards. And in simple problems, two tensions are equal in those two parts of the string. And in more complicated problems, you can get situations where the tensions are unequal. For example, if there's friction where the string goes over the roller. But let's not worry about that. Usually, it will be clear that the tensions in the two parts of the string are equal. That simplifies the problem. Let's look at another example. Now, think of something that isn't light. A heavy iron chain, for example, hanging from the ceiling. Here's a little exercise for you. I want you to pause the video and think how the tension depends on the position. Will the tension be the same all the way along or will it be higher, will it be higher in some places than others? Pause the video and ask yourself what you can say about the tension in the chain. Pause now. Well, I hope you've thought about it. The tension is greatest at the top and smallest at the bottom. The reason is quite simple. Look at the top link of the chain. That's supporting the weight of all the other links underneath. But the bottom link is not supporting any weight at all, only its own weight. So in general, a heavy suspended object will have tension due to its own weight. And the greatest tension is at the top. I could hang something off the chain, of course, like that. In that case, the tension at the top would be equal to the weight of the chain plus the weight of the object. But the tension at the bottom would only be the weight of the object. And we often encounter problems with stretching things like elastic bands or springs. That's supposed to be a spring fastened at the top. And if you hang a weight on the spring, it stretches it and the tension increases and the thing settles till the tension balances the weight and the tension increases as the amount of stretching or extension increases. So the more you stretch the spring, the bigger the tension gets. The word extension is a very useful one. It just means the increase in length compared to the original length. And the more the extension increases, the more the tension has increased. And one rather difficult one to finish off with, in 
longitudinal wave motion, which you may or may not have met, wave motion, you can actually get moving patterns of high and low tension. Moving patterns of high and low tension occur. I'll very briefly try to explain what that means. If you take a long spring, like a slinky, and fix one end, and pull the other end, then the thing is stretched and the springs are opened out and the tension is the same all the way along. But if you give the left hand end a quick flick in and out, you will see a pattern on the spring. Some places will have bunched up turns of the coil, some places next to it spread out. Now where they're spread out, the tension is higher than the normal resting tension, where they're bunched together the tension is smaller than the resting tension. So you've got a pattern there of high, low and high tension. And if you look at that spring a moment later, that pattern moves along. It's a wave motion which can propagate, move along the spring. And the new pattern a moment later will look something like that. And that pattern of different tensions is travelling along and that's a property of longitudinal wave motion but we're not going to go into the details of that here. That just leaves uh, compression and terminology. So let's talk about compression. Here's an iron girder in red, supported by two pillars in green. So they're big concrete pillars and an iron girder resting on them. Now, if you think about it, the weight of the iron girder is pressing down on the pillars and trying to compress them. If they were soft material they might get squashed, compressed. And the force inside the pillars which resists the compression, resists the squashing, is called compression. So if you want a definition of this force, compression, we can say compression is the force in an object which opposes it being squashed. And that's very similar to tension, isn't it? Tension is the force in an object which opposes it being stretched. So this is just the opposite. So, how could we show compression on the diagram? If you were asked to mark the compression force, where would you mark it? The internal compression inside the pillars. How do you show that? Pause if you want to think about it. And the answer is, we draw outwards arrows. The direction of compression is outwards. It's the opposite to tension. So, just think of compression as being the reverse of tension. They are two sides of the same coin. And be aware that the word compression can also mean the amount something is compressed like you say the compression is two millimeters means it's been squashed two millimeters but in the context we're talking about compression means the internal force acting outwards inside an object and here's a short question for you let's suppose we've got an iron girder which weighs 10 kilonewtons I want to know what the compression in each pillar is how big is the compression in each pillar? And what have you assumed to work that out? So just pause, read through that for yourself and see if you can answer those two questions. I hope you've tried those. The compression is 5 kilonewtons. Each pillar is providing support and that's because it's under compression and there's a compression of 5 kilonewtons in each one. And to work that out, which is the second question, you had to assume that, first of all, the thing was symmetrical. I didn't give you any sizes, but you've assumed that the center of gravity is in the middle and that the pillars are equally spaced on either side. So you've assumed the thing is symmetrical and you've also ignored the weight of each pillar. You've assumed the weight of each pillar is negligible. If we didn't assume that, then the compression at the top would be 5 kilonewtons, but the compression at the bottom would be 5 plus the weight of the pillar itself in kilonewtons. OK, to finish off, we just need to talk briefly about some terminology that you may meet when you read questions about tension and compression. 
So in some questions you may be told that an object like a rope or string under tension is inextensible and all that means is it doesn't stretch or it only stretches a negligible amount that you can ignore. Of course in real life nothing is completely inextensible even a piece of steel if you apply a force it will stretch a tiny amount. So inextensible basically means you can ignore the fact it can stretch. Um, also you may be told that an object like a rod or pillar under compression is incompressible and fairly obviously that means it doesn't compress, it doesn't get squashed. A third term you may encounter, you may be told that something, a block maybe, is rigid. That means if there are forces applied to it, one or more applied forces, it doesn't change shape because of the forces. If it's rigid, it doesn't get deformed, it doesn't change shape, it doesn't stretch, it doesn't bend, it doesn't twist, it's rigid. And the final term you may be told about is light. You may be told an object is light and that means you don't have to worry about its weight or its mass. A very common phrase you'll find in questions is you have a light inextensible string. So you don't have to worry about the weight or mass of the string and you don't have to worry about it stretching. You can pretend it doesn't stretch at all. Okay, well we're done. So if you have watched all four parts of this you'll know about weight, normal, reaction, normal force, friction and tension and compression and that will give you a good start for a wide range of problems that you may encounter. Thank you very much for watching.